important not to overlook your collision avoidance responsibility in a twin. At higher speeds, your maneuvering area is much larger than it is in a single-engine airplane, and with more systems to monitor, there's a tendency to concentrate your attention inside the aircraft. Your altitude must be no lower than 3,000 feet AGL when entering or completing multi-engine maneuvers. The first one we'll look at is a steep turn. It is flown at a constant airspeed and altitude with two 360-degree turns in opposite directions. Before you begin, note your entry heading and, if possible, select a road or prominent landmark to keep you oriented throughout the maneuver. Your airspeed should be no higher than maneuvering speed or as recommended. When you're stabilized, smoothly roll into a coordinated 45-degree bank. Since most twins have a sloping nose cone, your visual references may appear different than those in a single-engine airplane. So, use both visual references and instrument indications for the proper aircraft attitude. As you approach the original entry heading, smoothly roll out and reverse direction into the second 360-degree turn. Due to the high wing loading, you should make smooth, coordinated control inputs to avoid approaching a stall or exceeding the structural limits. Complete the maneuver by rolling out on the original entry heading. Maneuvering during slow flight, like steep turns, is done at a constant altitude and airspeed with both engines operating normally. You'll practice this maneuver with various combinations of flap and gear positions, as well as in straight and turning flight. Begin by maintaining altitude as you slow the airplane to five knots above the stall speed, or DMC, whichever is greater. Once you're established in slow flight, you'll practice changes in the configuration while maintaining the desired airspeed, heading, and altitude. When making turns, use smooth, gentle control inputs and keep turns to a shallow bank. An increase in power usually is required to maintain airspeed and altitude. To transition back to cruise, increase power, raise the flaps to the takeoff setting, retract the gear, and accelerate in straight and level flight. Retract the remaining flaps as speed increases. Stalls are the final maneuver we'll discuss in this section. You must demonstrate both the recognition of and recovery from a stall situation. They are performed with various configurations of gear, flaps, power, and bank angles. Never practice stalls with one engine at reduced power. Do not allow the airplane to develop into a full stall, but recover at the first indication of an approaching stall. This may be the first indication of aerodynamic buffeting or loss of control effectiveness. Let's take a look now at two types of stalls, a recovery from a straight ahead stall and a turning stall. The demonstration of the straight ahead stall in this presentation will be in the approach to landing configuration. So the landing gear and flaps are positioned as if in a landing approach. Slow the airplane to the best single engine rate of climb speed, VYSE, while maintaining altitude. Set the power as you would for a stabilized power approach. Then, gradually increase the pitch attitude to reduce the airspeed. At the first indication of a stall, lower the nose, add full power, and raise the flaps to the takeoff setting. Once you've regained flying speed, smoothly raise the nose to a climb attitude and retract the gear when you have a positive rate of climb. One way to perform a turning stall is in the takeoff and departure configuration. In this example, the landing gear is up and flaps are set to the takeoff position. The use of flaps is optional, depending on the situation being simulated. Again, slow the airplane to VYSE while maintaining altitude. When you set the power, don't use full throttle since it may result in an excessive pitch attitude and altitude gain. Turning stalls are done with 20 degrees of bank. 
At the first indication of a stall, smoothly lower the nose and apply full power while you level the wings. Once you've regained flying speed, smoothly raise the nose to a normal climb attitude and retract the flaps as you accelerate. Avoid increasing pitch or retracting the flaps too soon and causing a secondary stall. You should be able to recover to any airspeed and configuration required by your instructor or the flight examiner. An engine failure is a critical situation in any aircraft. In a multi-engine airplane, you have more options to deal with the problem than in a single engine. This section looks at some of the considerations associated with an engine failure in a light twin. The first step is a thorough understanding of engine out aerodynamics. We'll begin with the most serious engine out situation, loss of the critical engine in a conventional twin. You'll remember that in a twin engine airplane with both propellers rotating clockwise, the loss of the left, or the critical engine, causes the most significant directional control problems. Changes in lift, thrust, and drag are the forces that produce these problems. For example, the lack of induced airflow over the left wing produces an imbalance in lift. This asymmetrical lift causes a rolling tendency toward the inoperative engine. The torque of the good engine's propeller adds to this rolling tendency. The asymmetrical effects of thrust, aggravated by P-factor, produce a yaw toward the inoperative engine. This yaw also causes a further loss of lift since the flight path is no longer parallel to the longitudinal axis. And part of the airflow over the left wing is blanked out by the fuselage. As you deflect the control surfaces to overcome the roll and yaw, total drag on the airplane increases. Aileron drag acts asymmetrically because the down aileron produces more induced drag than the up aileron. The rudder deflection needed to overcome yaw adds to the total drag. Also, the windmilling propeller produces a great deal of asymmetric drag. Although an engine failure cuts available horsepower in half, the combined effects of asymmetrical lift, thrust, and drag cause as much as an 80% loss of performance. Although these same factors are present in aircraft with counter-rotating propellers, the prop rotation minimizes some of the adverse effects. For example, if the left engine fails, the torque of the operating propeller now opposes the asymmetrical lift generated by induced airflow and reduces the rolling tendency. Asymmetrical thrust still causes a yaw toward the failed engine, but the effect of P-factor is less. This is because the descending propeller blade is always the one closest to the longitudinal axis. Regardless of the type of airplane, as you slow it down, you reach a point where the rudder can no longer counteract the yawing tendency. At this point, called VMC, the airplane will become uncontrollable unless you take immediate action. Each multi-engine airplane has a VMC that's established under a specific set of conditions. This normally includes the aircraft loaded to maximum takeoff weight the center of gravity in the most unfavorable position, the critical engine inoperative, the propeller windmilling, the operating engine producing takeoff power, the gear retracted, the flaps in the takeoff position, and up to five degrees of bank established toward the good engine. VMC relates only to directional control and has nothing to do with an airplane's ability to climb or even maintain altitude. It is shown as a red line on the airspeed indicator of multi-engine airplanes. It's important to realize that at any given time, an airplane's actual VMC may vary due to changes in weight and balance, density altitude, power settings, and aircraft configuration. 
It's a common misconception that when an engine fails, a twin is flown wings level with the ball centered. Let's look at why this is not a good practice. The yaw of an engine failure causes the ball to move toward the operating engine. The amount of rudder pressure required to center the ball actually produces a side slip toward the inoperative engine. Flight tests have shown that this configuration may increase VMC as much as 20 knots and may reduce climb performance by 300 feet per minute in some airplanes. A much better procedure is to bank the airplane approximately 3 to 5 degrees toward the good engine and let the ball deflect about one ball width toward the operating engine. This configuration produces a zero side slip and requires less rudder pressure to maintain a streamlined flight path. As you can see, engine out aerodynamics are a challenge, but the knowledge is vital to your capability as a multi-engine pilot. Let's turn our attention now to some engine out performance definitions. An airspeed you will probably use in your training is VSSE, or the intentional one engine inoperative speed. This is a minimum airspeed established by manufacturers for intentionally rendering one engine inoperative during training. When you practice single engine air work, you should never feather a propeller below 3,000 feet AGL. As we mentioned before, VXSE is the best single engine angle of climb airspeed. This is an important speed during a maximum performance takeoff over an obstacle. If an engine fails after you're airborne, you use this airspeed to clear the obstacle. The best single engine rate of climb speed, VYSE, sometimes called blue line airspeed, has several applications to multi-engine flight. It gives you the best rate of climb, or the slowest rate of descent if you can't maintain altitude. Another application of VYSE is in connection with the single engine service ceiling. This ceiling is the maximum density altitude at which VYSE will give you a 50 foot per minute rate of climb with one engine inoperative. The single engine absolute ceiling is the maximum density altitude an airplane can reach and maintain on one engine. Now that we've discussed the theory of engine out flight, Let's look at some practical applications. The first engine out operation we'll cover concerns the procedures to follow in case of an engine failure. If you ever have to shut down an engine, it's imperative that you use the checklist in the pilot's operating handbook to make sure that all tasks are done properly. The manufacturer may recommend that you commit some items to memory, but after completing all actions, you should refer back to the checklist to ensure that those items were accomplished. In the event of an engine failure, there are several general steps to follow. Your first step is to apply full power, then reduce drag, identify which engine has failed, verify that you have correctly identified the failed engine, and finally, shut down the failed engine and feather the propeller. Let's take a closer look at each of these steps. Once you realize an engine has failed and you have the airplane under control, apply maximum power by moving the mixtures, propeller controls, and throttles forward. To reduce drag, you will use